the only podcast where the worlds of comedy, self-help and business collide. I'm your host, Callie Beaton, and my guest today is someone whose working life has never exactly been what you could call dull, having started as she paid her way through Yale, still a virgin, by being a pro dominatrix. Now, sex work is far from a new profession. In 1806, out of London's total population of one million, an estimated 50,000 women were engaged in some form of sex work. If I knew as much about maths as I do about sex, I'd be able to tell you exactly what that means in percentage terms, but I do know there are currently over 70,000 sex workers in the UK, nearly 90% of whom are women, most of them working mothers trying to support their families. The debate about legalising sex work has always stirred up strong feelings on both sides. Howdy. Hello. How are you doing? Okay. I'm changing all of my sound settings on Zoom because I have them set up on my computer and Zoom was like, fuck your thoughts. That's today's guest, American comedian, storyteller and actor, Desiree Birch. The average age of entry into sex work is 19, which may be about the only average thing about Desiree. Zoom's got a real inflated sense of itself since the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've heard of me. I'm Zoom and it's like, bitch, nobody cared about you until we all couldn't talk to each other. Desiree is a self-described New York to London transplant. As she puts it on the podcast, I came for love, I stayed for work. She has an impressive list of credits, including TV appearances on the BBC's Frankie Boyle's American Autopsy, Channel 4's 8 Out of 10 Cats. She's the voice of Pamela Winchell on the international hit podcast Welcome to Night Vale. And she's guested on pretty much all the Radio 4 shows I spend my nights dreaming of being invited on. And if that's not enough, she's the voice of Netflix's Too Hot to Handle and creator of Fat Chat on Comedy Central UK. Desiree and I talked about ancestry, love, tortoiseshell cats, but I started by asking her about an unexpected addition to her lockdown bubble. My bubble did expand at some point this last year. How so big I, did it get, Desiree? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't want to ask a woman how, how <laughs> big her how bubble big is. is. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Excuse me, do we know each other? No, it is. Well, it's grown uh, just a little bit larger to uh, a boyfriend. Um, you know, he has, has a it? family, but yes. So hold on, how did you manage? Because I, as you know, I kind of got mine into a hostage situation. I met him not long before uh, lockdown and then he was like, he couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. So that was a good, so I've just held on to him and he'll obviously be going when lockdown lifts, I guess, in like four weeks. <laughs> like, so I have four weeks more in this relationship. Although, but you got one. Are you yeah. mad about that? Because like, you know, you might be like, I only have four more weeks. And then you're like, I only have four more weeks. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. But how did you get one during, how did you get, you really are a covid winner desiree how i did got you get one on an app and i don't understand how it worked because it didn't work during regular times but generally when life does an upside down suddenly it makes sense for me suddenly i'm like oh everybody's in the shit this makes perfect sense this is what life actually is so like let's operate freely knowing that we're here you know in the underworld so um, yeah, I literally met him on on Hinge. I don't really need to give them like a plug here or whatever, but it worked out. And I think the timing worked out that, you know, I was talking to a couple of people when I met him and all of those people, I was having very grounded, real, authentic, heart bared open conversations with because that's where we were as a society. Like there were people who were kind of like, hey, what's up? What are you wearing? And it was just like, no. Like, no, yeah. we're not doing no that. Dick, no dick pics. Yeah, I don't care. I get that you have a dick and it's lonely. I have a body and it's like covered in yesterday's food and clothing. So that's what I'm wearing. <laughs> you know, like if you want to come get with that, that's cool. If not, like, 
You know, it's like, I'm, you're not coming over here. I'm not coming over there. I'm not taking anything off on a phone. I'm not like, it's no. Do you know what I mean? Just no. So did you go straight? This is, I can't believe that I've actually missed the best time to be single in the history of humans. I mean, you know, as, as a woman in her fifties, who's had many years single, I can't believe I blew it at the one time you could go straight into meaningful chat and no, no dicks being shown. So you were talking to two or three people. Yeah. I'm just fascinated by pandemic online dating dynamics. I, it and was, then did you get like, did did you get more vulnerable? Were you able to kind of just let yourself be seen because you couldn't actually be seen? I think that I would say, Cal, like, yes, it is a confluence of where I was in my own path and where the path actually was in its own path and also the people that I was encountering, right? Because like there's never just one sort of causality for anything, but I would agree with what you sort of asserted in that, yes, you are able to, uh, able to, or required to, like at some point you're just like, how are you feeling? I don't know. I'm scared shitless that this might be the last two weeks of my life. Cause that's what we all were in, in like April and May and whatever of last year. Like yeah. we don't understand people who are younger than us are like uh, turning into the thriller video and like not even dying of like anything remotely normal. And then at some point in the middle of that, like also then they were just randomly <laughs> killing black people again. And you're like, what is happening? Wait a yeah. second. Are we doing zombie rules? Are we doing, racism rules what are we and it was just like no rules no rules. it was like retro summer for all the bad things it's like let's bring back the plague yeah let's bring back like, yeah heavy racism yes, it was a really bad it was the worst nostalgia summer ever yes it really really was you're like you remember the last time we had a big revolution? i didn't even like the first album why have you brought another, another album one was, uh, like 60 yeah. years ago this was woodstock and now yeah. it's a circle of hell like yeah we get you're trying to have a festival but like this isn't what what's on um so yeah i think that it it just meant that you kind of invested in the chat which i think is important and it's weird because you know as someone who spent a lot of time single i think you can probably affirm that that especially if you're doing online things the like too long of a chat can kind of go one or two ways you know yes. like at some point you're like oh this is going to nowhere and we're just like living in this weird fantasy and like i've had full fledged relationships that like never left 2d you know, that I was just like, I can't believe we've poured so much of ourselves into this. And then when it came time to show up, you just disappeared or whatever. And you literally cannot believe that's happened, right? Because you yeah. feel, I, I don't know if you've been, there's been so many kind of articles about people who are like, I've really met my soulmate and I can't wait to meet them. And they're in Australia, but I know I love them. And and you can see like all the comments below, everyone's like, well, I'll just, you know, back up a little bit and yeah. maybe just manage your expectations. Because you moved to London for a, well, for a guy with yes. a guy for yeah. for a work permit, I don't know how you'd describe it. I but moved you did for come the guy. Over. I moved yeah. for the guy. You know, I came for love and stayed for work. Um, yeah, and usually people do it the other direction. And maybe that's a thing for people's lives. That's what it could say on all our tombstones. I came for love and I stayed for work. work. <laughs> that might be. Yeah, <laughs> that might be just. Wow, <laughs> that's actually a great T-shirt. I mean, seriously, like that's that is the sort of uh, metaphysical state of play you know i'm gonna call this episode that i came for love and i stayed, stayed for, for work. work yep that is, is it um is. <laughs> so you went because you were you're californian born right yeah, and yes. then you lived in new york you yeah. went to yale we need to always get that out there in any podcast. yes in any way because you know yeah. what like if i was a white dude it'd be the first thing anybody ever said and everyone would be exactly. like oh, oh 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 well he went to yale whoa <laughs> yeah, so I'm white duding you. You can have that one on me. You're Honestly, white dude. I'm yeah. embracing the white dudes who are like in my DNA because I've been come to see. I've been I've been come to to be shown that like they definitely need some kind of attention. Like, I mean, you can see my skin color. There's plenty of them in there. Um, yeah, loads of them in there. Yes, and we can also look at uh, <laughs> at history and probably figure out they didn't get in there consensually. So, <laughs> have you ever done one of those DNA tests? Because you can do them. Yes. I'm surprised we haven't. Have you done one? I've done one. I was so annoyed. Um, I mean, 
Like actually what I found out, cause I did the 23 and me early enough that I got some of the sort of genetic information that was interesting to like find out like, oh, you, uh, you know, process caffeine slowly, which sort of bears out with what I know for my life. If I have caffeine, like anytime after two, I'll be up until like four in the morning. It's just like, takes a while to get out. But of I guess system. you didn't need a kit to tell you that, it, but it's great. You were like, I worked no, that one out I didn't myself. need to pay a hundred, a yeah. hundred yeah. bucks for that. I probably, well, you say that, but a lot of times just you paying for a thing makes you go, oh, I would not have actually paid attention or time to this thing. So I had to like yeah, pay that's true. money to figure it out. And you're like, okay, well, you know, <laughs> lessons get learned how they get learned. So what they gave me, and it's, uh, you do need to apparently, like if you get more people in your family, your, you know, progenitors, whatever to do it, then you get more specified information. But like, essentially what it told me was that I was uh, all, like almost 1% Native American. I was like 59.1% African, uh, Western and Central. Thanks. So it's a big fucking continent, guys. Are you yeah, it doesn't narrow that down too much. Countries? Yeah. No, no. Oh, and I'm 39, you know, point something percent Northern and Southern European. Wow. I think they just didn't know what yeah. to do with you. They were like, let's just yeah. tick. Oh my, it, was it quicker to say what you're not? Well, you're not this. Yes, pretty much. They, what you're they told Welsh. me was that I was American. They were yeah. like, you're European, you're African, and you're Native American. No shit. Yeah. I can see that in the mirror right now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, but he, I can't get my money back. So now I know that like, oh, I have the kind of ears that connect and don't dip or whatever. Do you know what I mean? I do. I was wondering whether to do it because I might find something interesting out. Do you think I might? Where like where the red hair comes from? Where the? I think. So. I mean, well, what do you already know, or what do you? I know there's know? Scottish in there. There's Scottish. There's Irish. There's English. Yep. Uh, and I'm sure yep. a little bit of Welsh. Uh, so yeah. Yep. And I think that the ginger stuff comes from the kind of Scottish blood. But it's kind of that's sort of boring. I'd yeah. like to know. There's a road. Whenever I go to, um, I say whenever I go, like I'm traveling to Iceland all the time. But I've been to Iceland twice. My last show was about getting dumped in Iceland, the country, not the <laughs> shop. I should add. And uh, although that's happened too. <laughs> yeah. No. The. <laughs> My whole show was about having a row in Lidl. It was amazing. Uh, Everybody loved it. Oh my it. God, that's beautiful. I love but it so I much get... already and haven't seen it. But yeah, when I went to Iceland, I was really sure I was like a Vi queen and that I had some kind of history there. And I felt really, I kind of had this weird, it was probably just like, you know, perimenopausal moment, but I had this like, I belong here and this is where my, where well, I and a few people said to me over there, I know this sounds really weird and I have lost my shit in lockdown, but a few people there that I got talking to because I ended up traveling around Iceland on my own because this guy dumped yeah. me upon arrival. That's so I was incredible. Like, I could talk to yeah. you about that for an hour. So that is, yeah, that was a good, <laughs> good day. So I was like, I was going to go home. And then my daughter, who'd been to um, Iceland on a geography trip with school, I think that was the only reason she picked geography, to be honest. What school but did she, was she go to? That t- Just a local, it was a lo- it was the local, yeah, the local state school. Um, yeah, it was, wow. a lo- I, I made the mistake of saying to my son, who's, um, as you know, ha- has special needs, he's autistic. He ended up going to a private school for two years where for various reasons that was the only only one of my kids who's been privately educated at all and my daughter Mm. suddenly was like I want to go to Hogwarts and he's got a uniform and he's in this fancy school and so I was like honey we're going to send you to the local state schools but if they are at school trips if there's things that you want to do we'll invest in you that way so I wish I'd never fucking said that because she ended up, yep. oh, if there was a ski trip, everywhere. if there were, oh yeah, she was like, where's the trip? She would, she would backfill the subject she studied by where they were going to be traveling and then ditch them at any point before she got a qualification. So, you know, she, uh, yeah, she, the, the acorn did not fall far from the tree, but when I, I was in, she's so a when, badass though. She is. Yeah. She's in Holland. She's yep. in Amsterdam Same. living the dream. She just sent me a video of yep. they were ice skating on the um, canals because uh, we're recording yeah, this just after the beast from the east for anyone listening who wonders why she was able to do that and um and mm. she ended up <laughs> out there with a friend of theirs who was actually on a vespa on a full vespa riding on the canals so and a full yeah a full scooter yeah. riding on the canals but she um i will this they're story at I'm... the age they definitely don't <laughs> care about their lives 20 oh. something yeah 20 she's my daughter's <laughs> 20 and my son's 23 oh, yeah, yeah. 
yeah well, of course and her, they're never uh, gonna die use the vespa never on the, gonna the and actually never gonna leave home in my son's case <laughs> they had, <laughs> but the um the reason i was mentioning the iceland thing was so when i had this yeah. kind of crazy trip on my own and so of course you get talking to people because you're on your own and it's it was a really it was winter nobody goes as a tourist everything was shut so anywhere i would go people were really interested to talk to me because i was like an outlier like why was i there and quite a few people were saying that like that a few people said to me you've got a real icelandic thing you don't seem like a Brit you seem very much like one of us and I yeah I decided that deep deep inside me as a Viking Desiree I don't know if you can see him but I think he yes I can <laughs> I can to be perfectly honest I wouldn't be surprised if they were correct you would probably like it wouldn't surprise me if you had that kind of Icelandic Nordic thing going on or whatever you want to I don't even actually know enough about the history to know exactly specifically I know I think so we like, might both come oh, unstuck you're one now. of the fjordy fjordy <laughs> type of people right but they do love redheads there that is a thing so you probably felt like a goddess walking around Around there my friend Halston who's a photographer went up there to like photograph like fishermen in whales and stuff and like she's like like bright red hair you know and everyone was just like oh it was like the first time I went to like Northern Ireland and everyone at the pub turned around and like looked at me as I walked in the door like they hadn't seen that much melanin together in like a while <laughs> and they were just like you hello and it was like everyone wanted to talk to me and I was like I don't know why this place seems cool. It's like, yeah, because everybody there likes you. So like, I don't get that so much in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because everyone's like, oh, sure. but you go to Iceland. I have a feeling, and everyone's like, that's a Viking, you know, warrior. People like princess. the ginger thing, and actually in the states, um, I was get because you, you know, and you very kindly have helped me out with gigs in the states. But I used to work when I was working for Viacom still, so MTV and Comedy Central. I used to go to the states about one week in four one week in six. Mm. And I did that okay. for like on and off for about 20 years. So I, but I really, wow. I know LA a bit and I know New York really well. It feels kind of not home from home, but I've, I've spent cumulatively mm. a lot of time there. And you very kindly yeah. helped me with gigs there a couple of times. But do you find, because one of the things I used to find when I first started gigging was I, I because I was over there so much I would do the open mic circuit and and I got such good responses there because of my hair color and my accent I didn't need yeah. to write jokes I just needed to stand up there <laughs> and well I, <laughs> we're gonna look at you and be like oh cool pretty redhead and then you open your mouth and you'll be like what <laughs> And, they, and also, if you said anything, any kind of tiny bit of mischief, never mind going full blue, if I, with this accent, yes. if, and, and I would go very, if friends of mine would come and watch me do gigs over there, they'd be like, you are speaking like you're in the royal fucking family. You don't speak like that normally. And I would go very Queen's English yeah, because course, it just got me. Course. So a bit of me is like, if only I could just be over there, you know, I would probably yeah. be, you know, queen of the queen of the cable stations by now. Queen yes, of the networks. But you have to figure out the right way because New York, makes you pay and it do and it doesn't even matter that you've done it already they're just literally it's i don't know it is it is the abusive boyfriend that's what i wanted to ask you yeah it just does this because it's the only way it knows how to love is just to grind you down that's like literally all it knows as far as connection. and is that when you're doing <laughs> because what we do right is pretty we're in a pretty fickle business and the reason it, it's funny because looking at what you're doing to me I look at what you've done since lockdown. I'm like, wow, you literally are one of the few I know where your career is just on fire. You're on everything, quite rightly so, doing brilliantly. Yeah. But I think the thing about our world is no matter where you're at, we always notice the things we didn't get. We always notice the someone who's doing a bit more than we're doing. And we always think that we're the one who's a loser and everyone else is doing better. So how is it inside yeah. your, your skin? You're heavily analyzed by a rip off DNA test. Yeah. Skin. <laughs> how does it feel? How does it feel? To, Cause you seem like you're, it seem, you seem like you're pretty much winning at, at stuff at the moment. It, well, and I am so like, I am and I recognize that I am and I am so because it's my time. Like I, you know, it wasn't my time before and I worked for, I've been a performer for, I can't even count the, I mean, I could, but it'd be boring. Like, you know, I went to school for that. I moved to New York right after college. Like I was, you know, working as a solo performer, you know, actor, stand up, like anything that I could do on stage and particularly anything that I could write and do on stage because nobody knew what the hell to do with me on my own. I had to be like, I don't know what I could do. And then everyone's like, great. Uh, 
mm, keep going. Like, we have no idea what to do with you, but you're awesome. Mm. And then the time sort of changed to meet me where I am. Like, this is like kind of, this is sort of karmic work. Like, I was bashing my head against a wall until it was bloody. And at some point, the wall moved away. And it was going to move away on that time, whether or not I bashed my head or not. I just needed to feel like I was doing something because otherwise, like, you know, capitalism, it's like, what am I worth if I'm not working? You know, like, well, I don't have any intrinsic worth. Cause so I just have to like work really hard, you know? <laughs> so It's like, really interesting it, though about yeah. letting go of the, because it's a bit like with writing, isn't it? When you really try and write and the stuff just doesn't come. And then when you're just pissing around and talking to someone or doing something, I'll get more writing done when I go for a kind of dog walk with a friend who's funny yeah. uh, than I will yep. when I sit down with a, with a pen and paper. And it's interesting to hear with your career, whether you, because what, with what we do, the effort versus return is it's very poor, right? In the comedy performing yes. world. So you yes. can put in, uh, you know, they say hard work's a great substitute for talent, which may be true, but hard work guarantees you nothing, right? In our field, you can be the hardest no. worker and just not get noticed. So is there something about- Or you could get you, it and then it goes away and you yeah. never get it again. That's what I'm hoping <laughs> yeah. happens to everyone who's doing better than me. No, I'm not. I'm not hoping <laughs> that. <laughs> That's what I wish for yeah. all my colleagues. But is it, um, you were talking about New York. So there does seem, because yeah. in New York, right, there's the kind of assumption. So I guess you had, what, a couple of decades of being a performer in some way, shape or form before things started to really, really go your way. Is that, is that about right? Yeah, or was it, and things yeah. really, like, so I lived in New York for 13 years before I moved here. And um, th you know, there were plenty of things that went my way while I lived in New York, but of course you never notice those things because you're always so emotionally ground down to life. Well, why don't I have what everybody else has? Like the, the ambition monster there, it is, it is strong. It is hungry. It is in all of us. All we do is look at somebody else and go, how did they get that? How do like not whether or not you want it or need it. You don't think about your path. You just think about like, how do I get to the top of this like heap of bodies? And so there were plenty of things that were like going in the right direction, but it still kind of is never enough. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, it, like so many of us go there because we're like uh, still trying to act out uh, stuff from our childhood. Like, will my parents ever notice me? You know, like, will I ever get validation or credit? Like, you know, are, are you all just going to abandon me? Like I was afraid mommy would or whatever the fuck it is. It's a, always like a lot of stuff that when you articulate it to a therapist, you go like, wow, that's really petty and small. But like, th these are the, the sort of trappings of our lives. And it's hard wiring, right? I mean, the plugs of what we are, you know, that the, we, we are wired a certain way from what, the age of five, the age of seven. So that shit we have, you know, it's one thing to go, wow, why do I need to be on stage, you know, needing affirmation? Why am I hiding behind someone on stage? Because yeah. I find it so hard to be off stage. But that shit is very hard to unpick, even if you get the awareness of it. It's really hard to do something yeah. with it other than keep going on the path you're on. Yes, and kind of keep acknowledging when it comes up and go, oh, hello, darkness, my old friend, like not even in a sarcastic way, but just sort of like, oh, yes, this thing, you know, this familiar thing. Like, you know, you talk about that hardwiring from the time that we're five, it like in this life, in this body, but we're now aware of, you know, what comes down through like mitochondria and DNA and our mm -hmm. intergenerational trauma. We're wired from before the time we show up. But, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the, when people talk about the ancestors, that is a very real thing whether mm. it is your direct descendants like ancestors or the sort of ancient spirits like that those are like when you start to do the the work of like okay i'm gonna meditate or i'm gonna get the therapy or i'm gonna you know whatever do these investigations you realize and in some ways it's really comforting con to contextualize yourself in the universe like no you are not alone in the universe you are not sweet generous like you came from somewhere you will create other things that will have come from you whether they are young people or whether they are people inspired by you whether you know whatever people walk away with one thing that you've said and it completely changes them and you may never know that like that you are part of a context and you know, take responsibility for that, but also go, oh yeah, that's right. I belong to a larger human pool and this isn't all on me. So like maybe take it slightly less seriously or at least go like, it's not all about that thing I did when I was five that I like can't get over or that thing that was said to me or, you know, whatever that thing that happened, like 
yes, that is important. And that's always going to be with you. But it's also kind of like, that's the story of this particular skin suit, you know, and you've probably had other ones that had different stories too. Do you think, because like, I was not to say, answering any of your questions. No, no, I, I love like, it. Well, this is, hey, this is Namaste <laughs> motherfuckers. It's wide ranging. And um, I know I love it. I mean, we, and God knows we all have time to think about the big questions, right? It's like, what, what is distracting yeah. us from the big questions, you know, and the cats yeah. don't help. We're just sat there with them. Namaste I left home when I was when I was very young and I kind of made my mm. own way. And so I always wanted the kids I and mean, we have a very nice life. We're very lucky. You know, I was lucky. I had a sort of decent kind of job that paid me OK for years. Um, so we have a nice life. And the kids would sort of say to me sometimes as they were growing up, they'd be like, are we rich or are we poor? Or, you know, they just ask yeah, these questions sometimes trying to peg where we were in the world. And then I think some and I would always be quite sort of sensible about money and then they'd sometimes be like you know can we afford this milk or can, and I'd be like no it's fine I'm just saying you know you have to think about what you're spending money on and I used to say to them you know money money doesn't make you happy but not having money makes you unhappy and I wonder if it's the same in our business so the the stuff I, I had a couple of really big things about to happen when this happened I mean we can all say that because mm. no one can prove us wrong right I was about to be really <laughs> famous <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like, what yes. were you going to do? I won't mention it. But um, so <laughs> when that when that stuff goes away, and a bit of me has been thinking, you know, um, well, if I had been doing those things and the pandemic hadn't happened, would it have made me happy? And it might well not have made me happy. I don't know. It would have meant a lot of traveling and, and pressure. But then a bit of me also thinks, yeah, but not having those things has made me unhappy. I do feel a sense of loss and grief. And I wonder if that it's a bit like that with success and fame. And so looking at where you are now compared to yeah. where you were, say, five years ago, obviously where you were five years ago, I dare say there was more unhappiness about why am I not getting the recognition? Why do I keep doing this amazing work? No one's, not no one's noticing because you had a great reputation from the minute I knew you, which is five, six years ago. So you weren't by no means where you were nobody, but suddenly you're really a somebody. And how does that feel? So when you're in it, does, does it make you feel like a sense of, okay, well, I'm here, this feels good, the view's nice, or are you just thinking about the next thing? So I, I mean... This is all about like where your practice is, you know, as far as like what you're looking at. I said to uh, the trainer that I work with over Zoom the other day, because, you know, we have lots of time to talk in between while I'm panting, trying to catch my breath and trying to like prevent him from making me do another exercise. Um, and it's the only and reason we do Pilates and exercise, right? It's another person we're allowed to speak to for an hour and they can't hang up. We're like, you have to yes, be with no, me. Yes, no, I've paid yeah. you for this. Yeah. And so we're going to do this. And also yeah. like, thanks for watching me while I struggle through my own fucking physical form. Um, and try and to we realize how we look us. exercising, right? It's so depressing. I was, I always thought in Pilates, I was like a sort of ballerina and now I see myself, I'm like, oh shit, yeah. that's not, that isn't well, where I thought like, that there, was. <laughs> totally. Is there any angle of this laptop that isn't focused directly on my midsection? Exactly. No, it's a bad okay, thing. Cool. Yeah. But yeah, so, I <laughs> but, was, uh, so, you, so in terms of the view, yeah, where you're at now, not the view on Zoom well, when you're exercising, but the metaphorical of course, no. existential But the view. reason I brought that up is because I said to him, the problem is when you're standing on the peak, everything is valley. Everything behind you is valley and everything else in front of you is valley. And it is easy to get that perspective if you're looking into the past or if you're looking into the future that this is, oh no, like I'm going to fall, right? You're on the top. Oh no, now I'm going to come tumbling down off the top. And there's plenty of that fear. Like when I, I remember being in Edinburgh in 2017 when Unfuckable was happening and all of my comedy friends were like, oh my God, it's happening for you. You're making it. It's so big. And I was just like, okay, if you say so, I feel like I'm dying. Like I'm exhausted. I am working my ass off. I'm doing every one of these shows with like, you know, everything in my power and everything from the spirit realm. I am doing every extra show that they're adding. I'm doing every other spot. Like, and I don't know if it's going well or not. I just know that I'm in like, I'm working. I'm really, really working because, you know, that we all know with that festival where it's like, it's sort of like New York for a month of like, am I important enough? Will I make it? Will this change anything? Like, is this the thing? I'm going to pour everything I have into it and see if it gives me anything. And you do that several, several times before it ever gives you a damn thing. And you did it on the, you were doing it on the bus, right? On the, you did it on the yes. bus, uh, the top of the, but anyone who hasn't on been to Edinburgh, listening, bus. yeah, the blunderbuss, yes. which is how many people? 50? Yeah, top deck of a double decker. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, this is back back when people crammed into venues. I know. So Will they ever be able to use the blunderbuss again? Not this year, I guess. But that one, just to talk about Unfuckable, because so I went to see Unfuckable. Um, I saw it twice, actually. I saw it in London and I saw it in Edinburgh. And um, I, I took my daughter to it, so she'd have been 17 then. And I remember Amazing. you, um, so for anyone who doesn't know, well, you could t- tell us what the show, um, it, it's kind of a sex-positive so, storytelling kind of show. Yeah, I mean, essentially, the show is in part are, I mean, I don't know. It's about sex, power, capitalism, being a black woman in a big body. It's I talk about having worked as a dominatrix when I was a virgin, which is like sort of the big storytelling hook. So like that's it's a bunch of stories about like, oh, I decided I was going to learn about sex by throwing myself into sex work and figuring it out that way because I don't know in the weird value system I have set up in my head. You know, if I'm working at it, I'm learning, and it's like on the job training. You know, and so I'm also very practical though right because when you do when you think right. about I mean this show among other things is about kind of work and business and like how that all ties into comedy and other stuff but if you think about the economic model of sex work and effort versus return particularly I imagine when it when you're a pro dominatrix yeah. because you're I guess it's not even sex right that the end point is the guy is yeah. going to come but you don't have to it, it, it probably it, isn't yeah. even necessarily on on you let alone in you which no. has got to be a real I mean that's better than most of our dating lives right it's like easy that really quick. well when you go into something like that you go I don't know how many guys have jerked off to me on the train, just being on mm-hmm. the subway, living there, how, or how many times, like even when I was having sex after that, because I was a virgin of just like, how many times have I been with a guy where I wish he had left a couple hundred bucks, you know, actually, because that would have given me something and this actually took something away from me or gave me nothing. And uh, ultimately for the job of a dominatrix, you're not jacking them off. You're not having sex with them. You're not sucking or fucking anything. You are not touching them, except for with the end of a cat of nine tails, you know, a paddle, a flogger, whatever. It is all about fantasy. It is all about them and what they're putting into it. And like, yeah, you are watching a lot of guys jack off, but like, who hasn't watched a lot of guys jack off? Yeah, we do. You know what I mean? Like, they'll that. send you a video for no money, you know, yeah. and you'll be like, "Why did you do that?" So, uh, like, yeah. every time it was like, "Yeah, no, you can go ahead and pay me for that." Like that, and it is like you say, you know, return for effort. Like everyone's going to have some kind of service industry job when they're a young working actor. I could be standing on my feet for eight hours a day, which I also did at some point, and make a fraction of that money, even if I'm hustling with tips. And it's funny where the power is, then, isn't it? So the power people assume and again I know this is a kind of really intricate debate and we we've all spoken and and thought a lot about well hopefully we have about what it is to be a sex worker and the generalizations that are made about sex workers but one of the things yeah. uh, knowing kind of knowing you and not knowing you so I sort of know you on stage and I know you're a little bit off stage but in a way it makes perfect sense that when you were a virgin and you started to do this because you can hide you can hide behind the performance of being yes. a dominatrix yes. right so that is an act uh-huh. it's a person there's no intimacy yep. involved even if the other person thinks there is you know there isn't so you're still kind of hiding anything to do with your actual self right and do you think looking yes. back at that you've obviously now gone through the pain of intimacy and the pain of love and the pain of loss and do you, I guess you're really shielded from that in that, I guess, whatever, wherever you were in a dungeon or wherever it all kicked off. Um, in my mind, it needed to be a dungeon or you weren't really a dominatrix. Tell me I'm yeah, not Yeah, I mean, it was a dungeon, but it was like an office building that's set up to be a dungeon. But was I guess it above it's a nail like a London dungeon yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's somewhere in Midtown. So you're literally like, it's one floor of an office building, you know, like yeah. the other ones have other jobs going on. You go in here and suddenly it's got a different look and all the rooms have themes and you're exactly right like I was an actor so I got to learn about sex first by well I got to learn about sex first by like seeing porn because I grew up in the modern era but after that by walking into uh, a role walking onto a stage walking into a character walking into a place that provided me uh, some kind of protection even though it was exposing me far more in some ways than just sort of being a normal you know in quotation marks person um, might have done at the same time it's kind of like well at least you know what's there like it's a weird thing to have started with that as a foundation of being like okay when you bring that into your regular life and you're like oh this guy is looking for 
you know, I, I mean, a lot of them are looking for redemption. A lot of them are looking for like, I would like to submit my will to someone else so that I will allow myself to feel the pleasure that I so desire without feeling the shame and the guilt that I have associated with that pleasure. And if I can go into lizard brain and I can give the power to someone else, I can allow myself to feel that. I've been on the other side of that and it is quite it, it enticing, delicious, sexy, pleasurable, all of that stuff because you let go a lot more than you do when you're laying in bed with someone thinking all of the things that you think when you're laying with someone, especially someone yeah. that you don't know. You know? You well, there's no high stakes you know, like, and you're, the, the fear of loss and abandonment, all the stuff that kind of makes us yeah. do what we do on stage, right? So yeah. we're scared we're going to be abandoned. We're, you're still standing on the hill, looking in the valley, thinking, yeah, I've yeah. got everything now. Yes, I have affirmation, but at any moment it's going to be taken away from me. And I think there's a bit of that with kind of love, right? When you're with somebody, you're, you're at the top of the hill when it's going well. And then you're thinking, please, please don't ever put me back in the valley, please. And deep inside <laughs> myself, maybe that's where I belong. And I guess with the stuff, um, mm -hmm. you know, when, when you're taking sort of emotion out of it and it's a business transaction, there's no jeopardy. I remember you saying when I turned up in the bus with my daughter and she looked quite young at 17 and, you were, <laughs> and I, knew what, I, I knew what the show was about. And you were like, you were like, how old, how old are you? Um, and then you were like, you, you know, you seem like a smart kind of kid. You know how the world works, right? And I was like, she's totally, she's totally fine with it. And she absolutely loved your show. And actually it was really interesting right she was sort of at the age where she was articulating kind of what feminism meant to her. And it was really lovely mm. to start to hear that versus what it means to someone my generation. And she found it, it was one of the shows she kept talking about, um, which is why we went to see it again, because for her, Good. it defined something about female power and the fact that we do have agency in situations where people yeah. may not think women would have agency. So I remember that that show seemed to be like a kind of a, a game changer for you looking from the outside in. And I think in Edinburgh anyway, yeah. we're, we're so exhausted and overwhelmed that we don't really know what happened till we get home again. And then we're like, oh, that that did actually happen. But do you think, um, yeah. so with that, with the profile that you then started to get and now absolutely have, I know you were saying at the beginning of lockdown, you were like, I've got some stuff on air. So in that way, it's good, but that brings with it all the difficult stuff. So do you, I, th I guess the higher you get, the more some people want to take you down, right? So you have to put up with that stuff as well, or, or do you not have yeah, much kind of trolling? Sure. No, I mean, I don't like, I mean, there's, there's plenty of trolling, but it's not as, I mean, I am not as engaged in social media as I could be. So things are like, I'll, I, I put stuff up when I need to put stuff up, like watch this thing, it's coming out. I should engage with it more because it would be more effective and probably more pleasurable. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, let me go ahead and live my life now. As so it's like a PR record. thing for you more than a bearing of the soul. Yes. And I think that the people who bear their souls find that they get more out of those connections, but also you put more up to risk. Like mm. I, I totally get hate uh, after doing certain things. Usually it's after doing radio for, which is so unfortunate, but like, I heard you is, say that. Yeah. Lot. What's that about? What would you think I that's think about? It's, I think, I think that there's a lot of, uh, possession on the part of the audience, you know, in particular, I find that, and I think it also happens to other women and especially other women and people of color after doing that show. If you're not the normal thing, someone will like some weird slithering eel or snake will come and seek you out to be like, you don't belong here, essentially, you know, whether it's like, well, if you're complaining about stuff here, go back to your own country. And it's like, no, like I pay too much money to be in this one. So no, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's not the way that works. Um, and also like, you know, I believe that we complain about the ones that we love the most. Like the only reason I'm talking about this is because I care, you know, and I do have a right to critique, you know, those that I care about, like, because they should critique me back, like we should grow together. Um, but I think that there's a certain possessiveness on the part, uh, especially sort of the old guard, which is very, very white, very, very you know, male centric, you know, and all of like, and you don't fit in here. So why are you even trying to come in? And it's kind of like, this isn't just, this isn't a locker room. 
do you, you know what I mean? This is radio for the British public. And, you know, it's just like being in a comedy club and being like, you're not really that funny. And it's like, you're not the only audience member in the fucking room. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I might not be funny to you. And that means I'm not for you. I'm for that woman who was laughing next to you or that like guy who was three rows back, who was clapping, you know, it wasn't for you. That's fine. It is great. You can see that though. Cause I think a lot of us, like we, you know, there's the famous cartoon of, you know, the comedian's view of an audience and there's the audience with everyone laughing and one person looking stony faced yeah. and then the comedian. <laughs> Comedians view all they can see is like a big spotlit exactly. stony face but the belonging so, thing I think um that that's the bit that's I don't know how you how where you're at on that but one of the things I've noticed in lockdown is any feelings I had of not belonging and in a way all of us as comedians and performers we're kind of misfits right so we find our troop yes. of misfits and no one fits in so everyone fits in but now yeah. we're not with those people very often. I mean, I know you've been filming some stuff, so you've had some sort of contact, but lots of us are doing everything yeah. from home. You'll yeah. be doing a lot more from home. And suddenly that feeling of like, where do we belong and who the hell are we? So then trolling and people behaving as they do, like in, in regard to Radio 4 shows, what they're actually saying is we're in a club. You are not welcome in our club. You do not belong here for whatever reason they've decided that. And that is an incredibly hurtful thing, right? Because one of our most primal needs is to belong somewhere yep. and those people are yep. saying we don't like we don't like you go sit over there on that it's like it's like being at school you know go sit on that bench in the playground because you are and not we're part of us point at you and be like we don't like you whisper 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 you know yes and it can it is hard i mean like just some of the craziest stuff and it's it's good when you get to the place where at least you sort of like understand whether or not you sort of like know it fully in an embodied way but at least you know that you know hurting people hurt people like this person who literally just sought my fan page out on facebook to be like dude you are so fat <laughs> you're like mate like i know and also like Do you say I, i've got a whole show about it watch fat chat you know I realize it, like it's making me you money. know <laughs> and like but he's like your belly's so weird i'm like yeah it is like bodies are weird and like but it's hard in that moment to kind of just receive the humiliation and go yeah and also like you're probably drunk right now are you okay because clearly you made a special point of seeking me out well or they're attracted to you and they yeah. i think there is also an like i, I hate myself for and they hate themselves kind of, because they hate themselves for what you. they're feeling and so they're saying some weird shit i don't want a woman who makes me look at myself like i want a woman i can get lost in you know and yeah and, and who is and who is the woman who'll define herself in relation to who I think she should be? They say, um, I read somewhere that opposites attract, then they attack. And I thought, yeah, that's a really interesting one. Because <laughs> the, thing, the thing you love, wow. and then you're oh. like, yeah. That, yeah. That, I was like, oh, that explains the last 30 years of my life. Namaste, motherfuckers. What would you pick as your namaste motherfucking moment? Gosh, there are too many to enumerate. I, I mean, I think that one that comes to mind, obviously, was saying yes to my ex when I moved over here. Like, we didn't get married, but I, I, it, was, it was one of the moments in my life where I realized that doors in New York were closing, and I, I turned my head to the other side, and I saw doors opening, and I had the wherewithal to walk through the fucking door. A lot of times we see the door open and we hide in the corner or we go, that's probably not my door. I mean, it can't just be right there, can it? And we stay in the room and all the other things. And, you know, I, he and I both realized, like, I mean, he even said, like, you should come here, though. Like, you'll do well here. And so, like, because he was like, I could move there. You know, he does tech. He could have done that. And I was just like, no, I'll move there. Like, all of these things that I was doing in New York were kind of feeling like, oh, I thought I, I thought I was going to book that thing. I didn't. Like, I thought, you know, and the second half of Unfuckable is talking about how, you know, I kind of got me too'd by a former boss. And, like, that was, like... I don't know if it was the first or the last pedal to fall on New York where I was like, oh, I got to get the fuck out of here. So like that was one of those Damascene moments of like once I was like upset and raging and I was just like, oh, I have to go. And then once that decision was clear, it was just about, I don't know, where do I go? Everything is just sort of like a painted on window and a wall. And then he was, you know, we had this sort of, you know, I went to Paris, I met him in Paris. Like it was all of these things that I was just sort of like, 
I think I should do this. I think I should do this. I was kind of listening and it was working. And then, you know, it was the, I was the first one to be like, I think I love you, you know? And he was like, I, I think t so too. And I was like, let, let me go and do this thing. Like I'm in my mid thirties. Like you got to do this once, take a chance. It could be a huge mistake, but I won't know unless I go. Like, I mean, it's the same thing as like going to an interview to be a dominatrix when you never even had sex. You're just like, I don't know. I met somebody who knew somebody who worked here. She said she'd get me an interview. What do they say at an like, interview cool. to be a dominatrix? I know. They like, it's what so is funny. your what? <laughs> well, my joke what would your friends say like, is something you need to learn. <laughs> what the woman who interviewed you says is, you know what this is, right? <laughs> Because <laughs> essentially, if you, if you want to be hired, you're hired because there's a good chance that you may not come back after day one. So it's like any of those jobs where you're like working for Greenpeace and canvassing or like selling things door to door where they're like, so you're hired. Yeah. <laughs> and standing we'll with a golf you're at the end of the week. <laughs> exactly. And we pay in cash. So if you don't come back, just let us know so we can get someone to cover your shift. So like, you know, but it, I mean that, I think that one was because clearly that 40% of my DNA that comes from this general region, I mean, Birch is a British surname, you know what I mean? Mm. Like it, it's, it was like, go here. These people are also your family and they will get you. And all of the hard work that I was doing in New York City, I just pointed in another direction. Everyone was like, thank you so much. We would like another cup of this stuff, you know, like, and part of it is the accent. Part of it is everything I bring. Part of it is that like, you know, I went to Yale. So I'm basically a white guy in a black woman's clothes, you know, and they're like, this is blowing our minds. And I'm like, great. Great. It's and you're so kind nice of talented. Let's let's be yes. clear. There isn't there yes, is a smattering of, of talent. I think it's so you so there. forty so But the we all know talent isn't enough. Like we all yeah. know, we have all seen amazingly talented people come and go because people like talent, but they also like it in the package that they want to see. Yeah, it has in. to be packaged right. And that changes what the right packaging is at any one year. And that's the scary bit, yep. right? Because that's the bit that's yes, out of your it hands. Is. So yeah, the big decision you will for eventually you, go out of fashion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We all go out of fashion. Yeah. So 40% of you came home and 60% of you went abroad, <laughs> yes. if you believe your, uh, yeah. your genealogy. Yeah. And um, yep. what's but your favorite? 60% of me was already abroad, <laughs> to be fair. So 60% yeah, yeah. is like, have suitcase, we'll travel. <laughs> what, you got work here? Yeah, I figured. Let's go. <laughs> you were 100% in. And what's your, um, what's your favorite joke, Desiree? Oh my God. So it's hard to ever say a favorite because it's just your favorite in that moment when I, <laughs> so this, I think it's, it's a Mercury retrograde. I'm totally in the past. So this is um, my friend, Carla Rhodes, who is a comic in New York who did ventriloquism. She's since gotten sober, gone into wildlife photography and she's great at it, but she was doing, uh, you know, stand up when I was doing stand up there. And I can't, I don't know. It's something about my sense of humor that, okay. So I'm going to redo her joke for you. It's a knock, knock joke. So if you uh -huh. can do the appropriate sort of responses to the knock, can. knock joke so I can tell the joke. All right. And so this is with her puppet who was called Cecil Rhodes. <laughs> so he was, a, he was white and he was an asshole and she could use him and have these conversations. So uh, her joke went uh, knock, knock. Who's there? 9-11. 9-11 who? You said you'd never forget. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's an amazing, hilarious punchline that she did for years and it always made people laugh. But the problem with that joke is that I would laugh at 9-11. <laughs> like, yeah. So yeah, yeah. in my mind, knock, knock, who's there? 9-11 is like the funniest shit I could possibly think of. Like, Cause that's pretty much life. It's like ding dong. <laughs> and so I would just like, every time I'd see her do the joke, like there'd be me laughing and everyone going <laughs> and then them laughing 10 <laughs> seconds later you I was were like peeking early on the floor. <laughs> yep yes yes i was i was like i'm ready we're here everyone's like you haven't taken it yet <laughs> so, you turned up yes. ready with your suitcase packed even for that joke so. <laughs> the last thing i want to ask you is if there was one bit of life advice you could give to anyone listening what would it be uh, I mean, uh, remember you have a spirit and do something about it or do something with it. I, you know, I mean, that's like meditate, 
pray, go on long walks, whatever it is, now is the time. I'm sure a lot of people have already started to discover that in this wide expanse of time that there are silences that are full of not only the insanity of our minds, but also like the calling of our hearts. It's just like, make use of it because at some point, like this time will be over and it will be something else and it will be time to work, you know, like not that we aren't working and some people are working even harder during this time. It's important to remember, but like, you know, do, do something about that. Like honor that, spend time with that because that's the game. That's the game we're playing. It's a soul game. It's a spirit game. But the body is an important place to practice that experience that, you know, you get this life of however many years and everything else is death. Like everything else is not life. Everything else is going, oh God, remember when I could smell and touch and like, you know, when I could hurt you know, and the acute pain of just like hurting, you know, like, you know, just whatever it is, is going to speak to you and get help. Like seriously, like you're going to start meditating. It's easier to do it if you're with a group of people who do it, or if you have some accountability or whatever, if you're going to go on a walk, it might be easier if you've got a dog or a friend you're going to meet up with or something, because, you know, these things require consistency and I'm terrible at that without accountability it's part of the reason I'm a comic it's the only way I'll write anything you know so like just I would say remember you're playing a spirit game and find some assistance in helping you play it find a playmate <laughs> that was the delightful Desiree Birch now every episode I pick a thing inspired by my guests that I'm going to try and this week I am doing a deep dive into meditation. It's estimated that 200 to 500 million people meditate worldwide and that meditation among many other things can reduce the risk of being hospitalized for coronary disease by 87% and the awake time of people with insomnia by 50%. I think it means it reduces the awake time, doesn't keep you awake. When I first did meditation, actually someone told me that 10 minutes of meditation equates to one hour's sleep in terms of the benefits. And I was like, that is a good effort versus return. Um, apparently nowadays, over 52% of employers provide mindfulness classes for employees. Now, as I'm self-employed, I'm gonna to have to sort this shit out myself. So I'm actually going to revisit something I tried a couple of years ago. It's one of the world's most famous famous neuroscientist Sam Harris has a mindfulness podcast called Waking Up with Sam Harris. I tried it a while ago, absolutely loved it. So he sort of explains some of the clever stuff about mindfulness and what's going on in your mind and your body, and then also guides you through meditation. So I'm going back in with Waking Up with Sam Harris. We'll put some uh, links to that in the show notes. And that is it for the show for this week. Thanks so much again to Desiree for joining me. You can find links to her website, social media and all the other good stuff in the show notes we'll be back in your feed next monday when i'll be talking to comedy legend arthur smith i used to come on to say good evening everybody my name is uh, arthur smith and this is anybody here from stretton tax office in which case i'm daphne fairfax i'm callie beaton until next time motherfuckers <laughs>